All right, what is going on, guys? It is time. It is time. I, I want to turn the music up a little bit. Yeah. This is going to be the stage everybody has been talking about. Nobody talked about the marathon stage, but this time around, stage preview, stage number six, the first time they are doing a chrono stage. And we've got somebody special on the line. None other than Willem Avenant hanging out with us. Willem, say hello. Yes. Hello, guys. <laughs> Making me feel awkward. I don't know. I was that special, man. <laughs> well, come on. <laughs> Technically, for most of the people listening, you're closer to the Dakar than most of us. So, <laughs> Technically, theoretically, as distance goes, I am. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Meanwhile, the rest of us over here in the on the Pacific coast are freezing our asses off. <laughs> and you're, and you're yep. in the summer. So, I am in the summer of training and getting hot. Yeah, it's been an interesting journey this last 11 days. I've, I've been doing a mini Dakar myself. So I've been on the bike uh, like 12 days in a row now, every day training. So that's been a very, very interesting 12 days. Nice. Yes, we have. Uh, so for those of you playing the home game, we've got a decoding Dakar series that we're working with uh, Willem on on his journey to the 2025 Dakar. Uh, so you guys can catch it on the channels here. You can follow him on Instagram and the world. You got all sorts of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, I'm excited. I think definitely in our January episode, we'll kind of decode what happened in Dakar this year. But I'll also tell you guys a bit more about my recent trip to South Africa. I've discovered so many amazing racing places. And obviously, I make road books from wherever I go and ride. So, you know, I've got like 20 road books around Cape Town now, which is pretty cool. Nice. Um, and then, yeah, there's a lot of things that happened on the qualifying front as well. But we'll leave all of that for, for later in January. Let's let's make sure Dakar finishes first and <laughs> give it the attention it deserves. I know, right? No, and, and then not only that, here, let me... Uh, uh, let me let me pull it up for those playing the home game so they can see the mess that is happening tomorrow or actually in uh in just a little bit <laughs> so we're uh mm -hmm. first uh okay so first bike is going to be officially they are actually right now getting into their road book time so they the first bikes are already getting the road books they've checked in and nine o'clock nine p.m pacific coast time is going to be the first bike departing uh into this chrono stage uh, so Willem and I were talking about this right now, and man, this is something new, 387 mile total special, 135 miles of liaison, right? And breaking it down into kilometers, they got a 108 kilometer road section up front. They've got a 625 kilometer stage that they're going to do in sections. And then they've got another 110 kilometers to get back home or back to the bivouac. So. The interesting mm -hmm. part is this is what we were just talking about is, okay, so they've got these virtual checkpoints, these sleep zones along the way, right? And it, it seems like they're kind of almost keep borderline keeping it a mystery is exactly how we're timing. But I think we got a pretty good theory of how it's going to go down. Yeah, I think so. I think for the guys that, that doesn't know, normally Victor and I work at uh, rallies behind the scenes with the timing and the tracking and the officiating. So from that, we we were decoding it from that perspective. And we also managed to get our hands on the race briefing for stage six. And I think between the race briefing and between our combined experiences on the on the ground in the field, I think we've created a very, we've created the most likely scenario of at least the easiest way to do it. If the, if the ASO isn't doing it like this, there is a better way. <laughs> I know, I know, right? Yeah, they, this, it's going to be, if they're not doing it this way, it's going to be very interesting to see how fast they can math because it's going to be a lot involved. Exactly. So they're, uh, and I wouldn't want to be that guy. I tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> I've been that guy before, you know, two in the morning and the stage starts at four trying to figure out numbers still and results. <laughs> so it's not, times. not, not the, uh, definitely not the business. So let's, uh, so let's break it down really quick. So we've got, uh, we've got three, no, it's a A through G. So one, two, three, four, five, six, we've got seven stops along the way, mm -hmm. right? A through mm -hmm. G. And that they call break break zones, I believe. Yeah, the break zones. So we're not going to, we won't talk. I mean, there's going to be fuel stops all over the place because obviously, I mean, th 387 miles. That's at least if you ran these bikes completely bone dry with their, what I believe is their minimum autonomous range, you'd still have to fuel them twice because three, I, I believe mm -hmm. it's still 300K that they got to pull. 
So yeah, that um, they give a good. They show the good. The refuels are. I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In refills overall, including the bivouac, so and the liaison. So mm-hmm. let's say just inside the special, you can refuel at the start. Mm-hmm. Then you've got a range of 193 k's, mm-hmm. so you don't want to get lost. Mm-hmm. Um, then you've got a refuel at point A, which is it looks like point A is actually your first. CPV, no. Your, so point A seems to be after your first CPV. Mm-hmm. Then you've got a 206-kilometer range. That's – oh, but you know what? I'm actually looking at the car one. Sorry. But the point is there will be enough refuels in the desert for them to – I don't think anybody's going to be running light. I think no. they're all going to be filling up full because they don't want to get lost in the desert and fighting that bike. I mean, I am, t- I'm, I don't want to call it scared. I'm like, I'm apprehensive for this stage after seeing how soft those dunes are. And just, the, I mean, I, I'm a amateur rider, right? For me to do a hundred Ks in the dunes is a lot. Mm-hmm. And to think about 600 kilometers, just dunes. I mean, I don't, I mean, the Dakar might have had stages like this before, but I mean, the only way that I can take this like apprehension of my chest is to break it up and say, you know what? Okay. It's 300 Ks a day. To me, that's like, you know, eating an elephant one bite at a time. At least I can do that. But to think about 600 Ks through those dunes with those bikes Mm-hmm. And then with no support in the middle of the night, I mean, these guys are getting canned food, a sleeping bag, and a tent. This is a, the one good thing is it's going back to the Dakar of old. It is making you excited for the Dakar of olden days. Yeah. Um, because all the all the, the people that are, I mean, I, I can see a lot of people complaining about this stage after they're done. Oh, but yeah. we will see. You know, we'll yeah. see. But... This is it. This is the. This is going to be where the boys are separated from the men. I, you know, I, I 100% agree on that. I mean, this is going to be. Because here, here's the picture I'm, I'm, I'm imagining in my head as I'm hearing this is okay. So, let's just say for the GP guys, right? Rally GP guys. We know they're fast. We know. I mean, obviously, we got guys that are really, really good in the dunes. Now they inverted the start order, so they're going to be starting towards the back. They'll have some tracks to follow. Bonus points there, right? So we're not really even worried about the first two, I would think, you know, I, I, I don't see them having a problem in getting to C. So to the C, uh, mm-hmm. the third virtual checkpoint, I believe it's, it's, yeah, the third, uh, yeah. CPV two at CPV mm-hmm. two, that's roughly three, about the halfway point, 347 kilometers. I feel like, I feel like what's going to happen is. Everybody gets through the start line. They're going to make their way to A, make it through A. The The slower part of the group is going to make it down to B. And then there's going to mm-hmm. be the top fast guys that are going to clear the B or CPV one. Mm-hmm. And they will show up. They are going to rate. The time is going to expire. Right. So B closes uh, at four thirty. In the afternoon, so for at 16, uh, 1630, it closes. So there's going to be guys mm-hmm. that are going to be between B and C. They'll, mm-hmm. their time, they'll finish their time, right? 1630 will arrive. They're going to get to C. And when they arrive at that point, there's the checkpoint that they have their CPV two. their time will stop. So whatever they just mm-hmm. raced past 1430, is added to is added to obviously their total stage time. Now what I'm mm-hmm. what I'm picturing in my head and I think is going to happen is there's going to be the guys that sneak by at 1429 just past B. And then they're going to mm-hmm. race all the way to C where everybody else was already so it's going to be you you may have already been there like just we'll we'll throw somebody out there right uh you know Ricky shows up at at C and then it's an mm-hmm. almost an hour later and then all of a sudden here's Luciano or here is Quintanilla or here's one of the other guys but it's because he managed to cross past that line at B 
before time exactly. expired. And exactly. honestly, I, I don't see where they could do it any other way. You got to race to the next point because if you, you, you stop or you give up mileage, I mean, I, I just don't see that happening. So. No. Um, and you know, the thing is the way that, that I see it is that if there's no way that anybody's going to be disadvantaged because as long as your clock starts and stops at a certain point, mm -hmm. then th that's it. So I think that idea actually makes it more interesting because if you get to a point, let's, let's call it point D, which is four o'clock, mm -hmm. um, you have 33 kilometers to go from point D to point E. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just sent you the updated uh, map for the bikes, the FIA map. Mm -hmm. Um, so you will, so then, you know, that, Gives you 33 Ks and let's say we get there at five, like you said, 555, 355, right? Um, I think that anybody that still has gas in the tank physically and mentally are going to push. But, you know, and, and then all that, happen, all that means is that tomorrow my day is shorter. Yeah. But it does, it's not going to affect my time. It just means that I'm 34, 30 Ks further than I would have been, but now I'm going to get in past my deadline at the next one mm -hmm. because I've already passed the deadline for the next one, which is four, which means I'm just going to stop when I get to F or to E, I just stop basically. Yeah. Um, and th that's the plan. I'm, I think it's important to note that if you want to tap out earlier, you can. So, you know, and it would be very interesting for the normal guys, not, not the top guys, somebody like when I go to one to see what your strategy is going to be. Because it might be a scenario where you like, listen, I, I'm going to conserve myself. I just want to get halfway through the stage. Then I'm going to tap out and rest. Mm -hmm. um, because you're allowed to do that. So... Yeah. Um, you can stop at any of the break zones. The only caveat is your timer only stops when the break zone time arrives. Mm -hmm. So if you stop at break zone D at two o'clock, your timer is still going to run for two hours yeah. to, till four o'clock and then your time will stop. And then your time will stop, which is, you know, and it's kind of interesting how, if you look at the, if you look at the map layout, how it kind of goes around and it loops, it's almost mm -hmm. it's almost in a position where I believe the ASO could say, hey, look, if you struggle to make it to 200 kilometers, there is not enough time in the day tomorrow for you to go all the way mm -hmm. down to BC and then come back up and then still finish the stage because you're still past up. A, A and D, those two happen mm -hmm. to be very close to each other, it looks like, at least on the map. So it almost looks like exactly. it's at a point where the ASO could come up and say, you know, good try. <laughs> We're mm -hmm. just going to cut your day a little bit short. You know, I, that, at least mm -hmm. that's what I'm seeing. And then as we, as we were, as you were just mentioning, as do you get further on in the day, the distance from rest stop to rest stop or virtual checkpoint to virtual checkpoint gets shorter. So it's mm -hmm. really not like you're, you, it's not like, it's like you have to make this decision. That's like, okay, if I cross this line right now, I'm committed to having to go, uh, another 150 K. No, not really. It's actually only 30 mm K. -hmm. It's only 50 K that you got to go race and then get that time, mm -hmm. you know, take that. So I, I, I feel like that's the, it, to me, that's the easiest math problem rather than, you mm -hmm. know, okay, now you redirect everybody back around to this and then everybody stay here and stand on one foot, you know, and you and you face East, yeah, and, and, you know, it's just, no, it will, it'll, it'll just create so much havoc with the timing. And I mean, the golden rule is you never have somebody going backwards on the course no. ever. Oh. So, you know, I, I think it'll be, and especially in those dunes. So I, I think it's a scenario of like, like you said, like, you know, we get to a point and it's a choice. Do I carry on or not? And I think that's where, again, you will see the separation. Like, you know, Honestly, I think if you get to a point one minute before your time and you're so tired, you're going to be like, oh, I want to stay here. And then the, let's say the true racers, the, the guys racing, they're going to be like, no. I, and I think because, I mean, think about the anticipation in, in the racers minds because nobody knows with these top guys what this is going to be. So think about each guy 
each team is going to have a plan because they're going to purely look at the distance. And my, my, my guess is that the terrain in there is Howlich. So I suspect, you know, the team manager is looking at these distances and they all have plans. You know, they, this one is like, listen, you have, let's try and push to make it to CPV5 because then tomorrow when you come in, we'll have more time to work on the bike mm -hmm. or other people will be like, well, let's see if we can finish the stage. So I think there's going to be so much of that going on. And I think tonight or tomorrow morning, your time when all of this has been said and done, it will be a super interesting kind of thing to pull apart to see how it actually went. You know, it's an open question. Do you, do you think anybody could reach EPV5? Oof. That's 550 Ks, <laughs> man, in the dunes. Like, that is a very insane. big, that is a very big chunk. That is absolutely a very big chunk. And, and yeah, like you said, you know, the dunes is not the easiest, you know, it's not easy in navigation. It's not easy on top speed because you've got, and I, and it, you, we saw the stage brief. They even said it in the stage brief that there are some big dunes that these guys are going to have to do. So the guys that are more versed in it, obviously, you know, the, the, you know, Nacho and, and Quintanilla, uh, Van Beveren, who are more regarded as more dune experts. Uh, those mm -hmm. guys will probably maybe fare a little bit better. But what's interesting mm -hmm. to me is to wake up tomorrow morning and try and figure out like, so where's, where? so where's everybody at, <laughs> you know, yeah. how far did we make it? You know, and that I think is uh -huh. going to be the interesting thing. And, and not only that, but like, just like how you were just saying is the strategy of it, right? You think, okay, uh, I made it to, I mean, I barely made it to B. I know I got five more mm -hmm. minutes. I know I can cross that line, but you know what? I could really use. I could really use stopping now. I'll spend those five. I'll give those five minutes away, but I'm going to sit and I need to address this on the, on the bike right now. Like this is an issue I need exactly. to address. So it kind of, exactly. it, it, it plays into that push or do you be like, okay, well, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to push another, you know, 30 K, uh, and, and, you know, just hope for the best. Hopefully it, it holds mm -hmm. together. You know, I, it, it's, there's so many little well, things to this stage. Uh, Exactly, because there's a, there's a whole different dynamic that opens up, which is the team dynamic. So let's say we are part of the team. I need to be sure that you are ahead of me and now I have a bike problem. Now all of a sudden I'm running not against the clock of the day, but I'm running against four o'clock or whatever because I'm like, man, I have to catch you in your bivouac tonight because you need to help me with my bike mm -hmm. or you might have a spare I need. Yeah. So, you know, I... Honestly, I think now that we talk about it, I'm changing my mind. I think that if I were a team manager, I wouldn't. I, I would actually want my guys to stick together on this stage. Yeah, I, I would actually be like, guys, whatever you do, make sure you're in the same bivouac tonight. Yeah, that's your that's your brief. If yeah. you have to wait for each other or go slower, but if because I mean, imagine having a team Honda or team KTM or team Hero spread out over three bivouacs, which I really think it's possible. I really think they might be spread out over D, E, and F. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and now you're sitting there, your bike's broken, your buddy is 30 Ks away. Yeah. Like you could probably run to him if you want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, he's across the dunes. Yeah. So that would be disaster. So I I would love, maybe, maybe you can try and get a team manager on the line on the follow-up show to 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 hear what the strategy was but i think as a team manager i would probably i would probably say guys stick together i yeah. mean it's not worth throwing the race away on the stage yeah i think it, yeah i i i'm gonna go especially with the honda guys challenging right now up at the top so to me i think where it's gonna be at is these guys will probably maybe not the full team, but you know, they'll see how the stage shakes out and then they're going to pair off. Like I could see, you know, mm -hmm. like we just said, you know, if, if Quintanilla and Cornejo are good in the dunes and they have a very similar pace, I could see them hanging out together. I can see Ricky and mm -hmm. Skyler hanging out together. And then once they get past that first, okay, we made it to this stop. Um, great. We're paired off. We can work, you know, give each other a hand tomorrow's race day. Mm -hmm is let's see how fast this thing will go you know tomorrow exactly tomorrow we race today we just survive and try and make sure that sure. we're there for each other 
at the bivouac mm-hmm. or at the rest stop or what? I don't even. What are we gonna <laughs> break zone? I don't know what they call it. or break point. Now I see another one saying break point. It's so yeah. weird, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. They got uh, they got all it's sorts French. of stuff going on. Uh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so, but yeah, so it'll be a, it's gonna be an interesting one. And you know, it's funny. And this is God, I don't know that we could ever have come up with a better pun. And I had no idea that this was gonna happen. But you know what? Mm-hmm. It, It'll make sense when they get there. <laughs> it'll make sense gotta, when they, get there. <laughs> they just got to enjoy the ride to the first stop. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm, I'm so curious to hear what the terrain is like there. I just, I am, I, I suspect looking at the road book and looking at the toast notes, say in the briefing, they give us these, um, what do you call it? The, uh, tricky notes, you know, I, I like if there's a triple caution down your massive dune, <laughs> you know, that makes me want to see this thing. I'm like, man, okay. This we're talking, we're talking some serious dunes and some serious downhills. And I think that's the other thing is bike conservation, right? These bikes have, we just before the race day, some of these bikes have been ridden as hard as they can. Mm-hmm. And if anything is going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong on this stage. So, um, we have to hope they get there. Yeah. I think maybe we can also chat a little bit to going towards the end. Uh, what's very cool is that, you know, if you get to the end, you're actually going to get the flight to Riyadh, uh, which is pretty cool. I think that'll be interesting. A bunch of stinky guys on a, on a plane. <laughs> on a plane. That'll be, well, that'll be very crazy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so they, they check their bikes in and then they fly to Riyadh for the rest day. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, and what's funny is I'm, I'm looking at it and we're, we'll, we're going to get over to the, uh, the starting order here in a minute. Cause we're four less than four minutes away from the first bike taking the stage. Uh, I'm looking through the briefing and the roadbook notes for the FIM. And it's funny at the halfway point and at the end of the, uh, of the, of the stage on day two, six B, mm-hmm. both of them have these, like the, the, the kiss farewell notes. I mean, I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't, there's physically not enough room (laughs) to put any more information in these tulips. I mean, they are bad. Mm -hmm. So we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll wait, we'll wait for this to happen. And then we'll probably, uh, I don't know if you, if you shared them or we'll, we'll share them because I think this is worth, uh, some people getting to see exactly like how bad this can be. I mean, if the, the people watching can see the background in mine, and this is a road book from Baja rally, uh, behind me. Still a great road book, and, uh, but there is a very big difference between that and this, uh, just in the amount of complication uh, that it is. So, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Not to not to take any No, no, it's 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 just it's a different, you know, it's a different type of race in this case. And I think that's the thing with these complicated notes is, I mean, you, your brain, you get to a point where your brain can only take so much. And I think if you're focusing on riding, mm-hmm. you know, that becomes that becomes problematic because it's like, you know, I have, oh, how do I get past like these things and focus on the road book, especially if you're hot and tired and what, what, what. So yeah. it's going to be interesting. It is. Yeah. That, that's a very good point. You know, you only have, uh, mentally, I mean, we've all been through it. You go through a really tough day at work and by the end of the day, I mean, you, you can't even decide which shoe you're going to take off first you know? And mm-hmm. so these guys have to do this for hundreds of notes and then they get greeted with that, <laughs> you know, as the last mm-hmm. as the farewell. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see. So, mm-hmm. all right. All right. So what the do you other think? thing I'm, I'm saying on a lighter note is, you know, they have what you get. So when you arrive in the break zone, you're going to get a survival ration for 24 hours. Mm-hmm. So if you're a big eater, that's going to be an issue. Uh, you're going <laughs> to get an aluminum mug. You're going to get a set of cutlery. You're going to get 12 50 kiloliter bottles. So that's six liters, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then you're going to get a bin bag. So my biggest question is, do you poo in the bin bag or do they have toilets there? <laughs> yeah. Because I don't know what the bin bag's for. Yeah. How do you, how do you do this? You throw everything away. Do you, yeah. You bury it in the sand. I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm sure they'll have a toilet. I'm sure they'll have it longed off in the desert, but it was just funny to me that they get a bin bag, but yeah. you know, six liters of water, you, you, cause you're going to have to hydrate as well. So this is truly a going to, be a survival stage it's you have to plan you know you're not going to be able to just ride it you're going to have to think about it yeah no i i i i think it's going as planned 
one, they've got everybody mm-hmm. going crazy over this, you know, trying to guess at how they're going to time this thing perfectly. And then, and, and I know they have to, and I know they have to, I mean, we were at, we were at Sonora, you know, we know how it is like, there is no room for error when it comes to dealing with, you know, the competitors and, and the timing and everything. I mean, down to the GPS, down to the meters, down to the, I mean, it almost seemed like millimeters, you know, that the checkpoint wasn't in the right place, that the sign wasn't in the right place, that the, you know, all of these little things that have to be exact and very, very precise. And it's because the sporting regulations, I mean, they, it's like teams will have lawyers, basically lawyers with them, you know, <laughs> that mm-hmm. their sole purpose there is to make sure that everything is in compliance, both with their team and then with the teams around them, because that could be the advantage five minutes here, five mm-hmm. minutes there, you know, whatever it is, you know, so I don't know. We'll, yeah. we'll see how it shakes and then down. We'll see, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty confident that the system that we, that, that currently is just going to work. So I think if we want to recap it for the guys, it's, it's very simple. There's six points. You get to a point. That point has a designated time. If you get to that point at the designated time, you stay there. If you get to that point, whichever one it is, A, B, through to G, if you get to that a designated point before a designated time, you carry on to the next one. Your clock carries on running. It stops at a designated time. And then the next morning, when you start again, your clock starts going. Um, another cool thing that I like is uh, going back to the Dakar of old. Mm-hmm. When you are in your break zone the next day, uh, there will be three honks from the car 30 minutes before you leave. There will be two honks 20 minutes before you leave, and there will be one honk 10 minutes before you leave, and then you're back at it. So um, that's going to be cool. That's going to be back into that spirit of the old deck. Huh? Yeah, uh, they're going to be this. This is going to be interesting. A bunch of guys spending the night in the middle of the desert. They weren't. Uh, I mean, the 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 marathon stage is one thing. Everybody's hanging out. It's kind of mm-hmm. a bivouac. It's the VIP bivouac for all racers only. You know, the membership costs the entry fee <laughs> and a very expensive mm-hmm. plane ride. Uh, but this is going to be different. You know, you really don't know who you're going to end up with. So that'll be, uh, that'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. So, totally, man. Awesome. Well, excellent. Well, let's get, uh, let's get to the starting order and then I'll ask you for your, uh, who you think is going to put the fastest time together. Sound good? <laughs> I can tell you yeah, that's that's pressure. You didn't tell me that's coming. Oh well, you know. Okay, I'll, I'll give you. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a minute while I go over the starting order to go uh, <laughs> to to put your best best well, guess I, together. I kind of have a moral obligation, so it's not going to be a guess for me. But it's not even an obligation. But okay, let's go. Yeah, I'm All right. listening. All right, here we go. So starting order for stage number six A is going to be John Beretta Bort leaving right at 9 p.m. He is on the Hero 450 Rally and then followed by Antonio Mayo in the number two spot. He is on the Yamaha WR450 Rally. Gimiza on a Gas Gas 450 Rally is going to be the third off. Gonzalez in the number four spot. Martin Michek five. Nacho Cornejo in the number six spot on the Honda CRF 450 Rally. Kevin Benavides on the 450 Factory KTM. Skyler Howes in the number eight spot. Going to be Honda CRF 450 for him, of course, Monster Energy. Luciano Benavides showing ninth, but remember, he's got a penalty. Something about an engine swap. So 15-minute penalty for him. That's probably, I don't think they've announced that yet, but I don't know if that time is going to be accurate. We'll see if that's exactly where they do end up starting him. After all, Stefan Svitko in the number 10 spot. He is on the KTM 450 Rally Replica as well. Checking in with Ricky Brabeck. Be leaving 11th, Ross Branch in the number 12 spot, Mason Klein 13th off the line, Daniel Sanders 14th, Toby Price 15th, Adrian Van Beveren in the number 16 spot, Pablo Quintanilla in the number 17. Let's move on down a little bit. Let's find some of our other guys here really quick. Uh, Devisi in the number 10 or 20 spot. Is he scrolled too fast? 27th. Uh, and then taking a look, we'll keep going down here because they were doing some inverted starting order stuff. Let's see here. Yeah, because I think were they doing the top 17 was or the GP riders with the inverted start and then they go back to normal. The normal. Or what was the, top, the decision? That's how I understood it, but I don't know Let's what see. they did in the end. Yes. 
So, yeah, so top 17, ending with uh, Adrian Van Beveren uh, mm-hmm. is the 16th bike off the line. And then the next bike in, oh, no, sorry, that's uh, Quintanilla is the 17th bike off the line. And then it is Tobias Ebster. Interesting enough, he's in mm-hmm. uh, Malamoto, Rally 2 Malamoto. <laughs> so he's he's putting oh, together cool, a hell man. of a race. <laughs> So that is, uh, I mean, that's kind of a rundown. They're top 17 with the GP guys up there. All right. What do, you, mm-hmm. what do, we, what do we think? Oh, so are we talking stage win overall for the two days? I guess it's the only way we can do it, right? We're going to yeah. see, like, the fastest time when they get back to the bivouac. Yeah. Look, out of the gate, you know, I, th- I think the, the best thing I've learned about dunes is that, you know, you have such an advantage if there's tracks ahead of you because you can read the tracks mm-hmm. and you can, w- you can see the quality of the sand and the drops ahead of you way better because of the way that the track displays, if, the way that it displays out and you can, you can judge the terrain just better watching other tracks. So I think the guy starting in the back has a huge advantage. Yeah. The, the issue is I actually think that they'll probably catch up the openers at some point. Mm-hmm. Now, Ross is Ross Branch is leading the rally. Uh, he's a fellow. He's not a South African, but he's Botswana, so he's a Southern African, you know. And that's uh, very close to my heart. I actually the first rally I ever raced and he raced in, mm-hmm. and I think the time difference between the two of us was something like six hours, which is crazy over five days. He made up an hour on me every day. Wow. <laughs> so um, I, you know, so Ross is for me is like a bit of a personal hero, and I I really support him. So. The fact that Euro is opening, right? That's gonna that's gonna create a lot of good stuff for the Euro team because clearly Ross can benefit from his teammate opening. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the fact that Mason is behind Ross, I, I look. I think that personally, this is Ross's year for me. I, he's been fighting this for many years, and it's very it's very rare to see somebody cling to the general lead. Um, for this long, you know, um, uh, he, he was off the general lead for a few days and he was back. So I, I am putting my, my hat in the ring to, but you see, I think we're talking stage win. He's going to play conservatively because he's done this before. He knows mm-hmm. that this is the chance where you're going to lose your right. So I don't think he's going to push. So let's, let's roll back. Who's got the most to win by making up time? Mason, uh, if if the okay, here's here's my thing. If the bike holds, mm-hmm. which I hope it does, I think Mason can take the stage win just because he's so damn fast. Mm-hmm. And at this point, he has nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. So if you think about it, any any team that's still in the running has got has got a podium to lose. Yeah. Um, and I, th- I think that if you've come this far, you know, what would be a better way than winning the chrono stage, especially for, for Kove or for Mason, for core, for core racing. Mm-hmm. So actually I'm going to, I'm going to take, I'm going to pull a number because I think if Mason starts behind Ross, Ross has got so much experience, um, and he's learned the expensive heavy lessons and it might be that that if those two can stick together, at some point Mason will just break away and he'll be like, oh. "Yeah, yeah, I, I, let me do it." I think that are going to be conservative. So that's my call. Let's see. Yeah. So claim uh, Mason for a, for a win. Is that what for we're... stage one? I'm if if the and I'm not trying to diss the bike. I'm just saying it's the same for it goes for everybody. If yeah. any of the bikes don't break, um, yes, yeah. uh, I think that simply because he has nothing to lose mm-hmm. and everything to win. Yeah. He has everything to get. Everybody else on that list has everything else to lose. Mm-hmm. Um, but because of these issues he's had, I think he's the top contender. Or at least I feel that he's going to be the guy that gives 110%. Yeah. He's going to be the guy that rocks up at one minute to the time and he'll still going to push on and not stop. Yeah. Oh, no, 100%. Yeah, he, I, I really doubt. The only reason he wouldn't, he wouldn't make the call to push on would be because he knows that he, can, he could better use that time to fix something. Uh, if need be, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think yeah. that's the, yeah, 
I can. Uh, yeah. So I can okay, that's that. interesting. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's all my guess. But okay. let's see. Let's see. I hope so. It will be okay. very interesting. So I, I think the big boys are going to take it easy, or at least I hope they do, because yeah. otherwise there's going to be problems. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that happening in the first half. Second half, it's you know all out war because now everybody kind of knows where they're at. Um, and it's a rest day, so yeah. I but I I think that. The, it would be a very interesting thing to see where they finish on today and where they finish tomorrow. Because my theory is that your your time where you finish today is going to be very similar to the time you finish it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, even if your theory is to push, because mm-hmm. again, you know, you're going to wake up in the desert, hungry, probably cold, because those tents are pretty shocking. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're going to be like, well, I have a rest day tomorrow. And yes, I can push. But again, the risk is just the same as yesterday. The only difference is it's not a marathon stage. Because yeah. um, I think that last section of dunes are tough. That's also why those bivouacs are so short. Probably short, yeah. Because it's going to be it's going to be very tough dunes. So yeah. I, we can only retros- in retrospect, we'll see, but I'm guessing that I'm guessing that the two stages, the f- finish orders of today might be very similar to the finish order of tomorrow, but, but yeah. that's just my prediction. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, I mean, I like it. I, I see this. I kind of see the same thing. I see that, you know, yeah, Mason doesn't have, uh, you know, obviously doesn't have anything to lose. Obviously, it's still safety first. It's not that he's riding. Um, I think that the bike, I'm hoping that everything has kind of been sorted. They, you know, these were the growing pains early on with the new engine package on the bike. So I'm hoping that tomorrow mm-hmm. he's going to be, I think he's going to be in a position where he's got enough. He's got enough fast guys in front of him that's going to help him make up some time. So I see him making his way up to the lead group. And when the, you know, the sifter exactly. finishes, I feel like he's going to be in the top there. And I fully agree. Yeah. And then, and you know, and then from there, it may just turn into, uh, it, it may go on to something where it just is the dune guys, the guys that are used to riding dunes. So I, I think that we're going to see Mason rise up to the top five again, uh, hopefully mm-hmm. top three. But I, I think that it's going to be, you know, one of the, the one of the dunes guys. So I don't know. I mean, it could be, you know, Ross Branch is a great candidate for that inadvertently. Maybe same thing. Top five up there maybe doesn't want to make it all the way to the front. So that way he doesn't have to open the second half. You know, this is going to be mm. interesting for that. You know, is is that will be very interesting. Who opens the second one? Yeah. yeah. How fast do I want to push? Because you know, Mason for Mason, I don't think it matters because for Mason, he, I mean, he doesn't care. I mean, (laughs) hey Mason, he likes opening. Yeah, hey Mason, what number do you want? Uh, That one, one. (laughs) Come get me. (laughs) You know, so I think that that will definitely, you know. I think Mason will, will, with no fear, will move, try and move as far up the field as he can because he's not afraid of opening. While other guys are going to be like, exactly. well, you know, if I open tomorrow, this may cost me my podium. You know, this might be it for me. Exactly. In the and I don't know. Exactly that. Yeah. Maybe some of these guys may follow Mason because they go, well, if this kid can navigate, maybe I need to stick with him. <laughs> you know? Well, and he can navigate. So, yeah. like, you know, if I can get any, any of those guys' advice, if you see a green bike, follow it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that he can navigate. No, uh-huh. no, that guy, it's yeah. fast and he can navigate. It's a very rare skill to have both. You know, yes. most of these guys have to either learn to go fast or learn how to navigate, and he yeah. seems to just have it naturally. Yeah, and we've, you know, it's interesting. We've talked about it at length off, off, uh, off the air or off channel. But I, there's a thing that I that I know, and I think Mason at a younger age, because he's at a younger age, his motor skills, his firing skills. I mean, it, when he looks down at a road book to look at a note, he will. I bet you could probably test it and see mm-hmm. how fast he reacts to what he sees and compare it to any of the other guys. And I, I am willing to bet that he can process it faster than anybody. And that's just, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, unfortunately. You, you, you're talking about the, the t- firing time of your bri- brain synapses. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's know, just going to be... Yeah. 
<laughs> he, I mean, I, you know, I, I can't. I mean, mine I've definitely seen... depends on the time of day and how much I've had to drink. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, and you know, and I know it, I know it from, from the RC cars and, and calling and race directing RC races and watching these guys battle over tents consistently, you know, tenths of a second. And I mean, the amount, like how quickly they can change and move and do and all of these things, it just, absolutely insane and then not only that then you go watch their hands on the controllers and you're like how is he moving that fast so there's got to be something to it mm-hmm. but i don't know we're we'll no, see there is we'll see well it's super awesome. super interesting i think if the aso and dakar has not managed to rivet the small group of us that absolutely love rally to our screens and you know in south africa people joke that you know you don't get anything done the first two weeks of the year because everybody's just staring at their phones and looking for updates so i think today and tomorrow is going to be it i think all of all of the deck our fans are just going to be glued to their phones for information because they so restricted so much that you know we're not going to know, and I also don't think they're going to have signal in these bivouacs, so we won't be getting personal WhatsApps and stuff, which is pretty much the best way that we've been getting information is from all the guys that you know that's there, you know. Yeah. So um, that's yeah. not going to happen. I know. So I think yeah. I think once they hit Riyadh and we get all the stories, that's going to be when the real stuff comes out. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see when we get the first uh, the first few messages of how things are going. So I'm I'm curious to yeah. see tomorrow morning what the map looks like. Like, how do I know where everybody mm-hmm. is at? You know, because we won't we won't see that. Um, they won't make that live until the actual. Uh, they're not going to make that live until the vehicles leave. So we'll see how that yep. goes. That's awesome. Well, I'm super excited. I can tell you that much. I've got a long, I've got like an eight hour drive today back to my hometown, service the bike and leave everything there. And then I'm heading back to the U S so nice. we will chat. I'll definitely follow yes. it up and yeah, let's see how it goes. Maybe we can check in once more before the end and see yeah. how things are going. Yeah, absolutely. With more predictions. <laughs> now I know. Now, next time I'll be prepared for a prediction. Nah, it's better. It's better when you don't. <laughs> it's better when you don't. Cool man. Awesome. Well, have a great All evening right, well, there, and uh, thank we'll you. chat soon. Let's yes. see how it shakes out. Sounds Thanks. like a plan. Thank you. Enjoy. See ya. Thanks. See Bye. Ya. Bye. All right. So there you have it. That was Willem Avenant. Willem Avenant Racing. You can see his picture there next to the map. Uh, photo taken by uh, West by One Thousand. If you guys haven't checked them out, they've been to the Dakar a few times they're a local photography and kind of almost jack of all trades kira does the writing and uh uh why do you him? justin does all of the pictures i don't know why i couldn't remember him but anyway phenomenal on doing coverage and stuff like that so if you guys haven't checked them out it's west by 1000 uh on the instagrams and uh and on the facebook so check it out. They got a lot of great work that they've done they've traveled to a lot of the rallies done a lot of the articles things like that done race reports very very nice stuff so always enjoy seeing their work and yeah here we go stage six first spike should be off of the line as of 17 minutes ago so we will see how this starts to shake out what are the predictions what are you guys thinking a little bit longer of an episode today you know the normal stage briefs are a little bit shorter but got a lot to talk about for this one so we'll see how it shakes out i hope everything is going well with you guys remember it'll make sense when you get there enjoy the ride see ya All right, so now that the uh, YouTube guys are gone, what do you guys think? Who's going to be the uh, who's going to be the winner on this one? First half? Or do you think we're going to get results? What are, what are we thinking? I'm, you know, I think Mason is a strong candidate for this one. I would love to see, absolutely love to see him on the podium, top one of the top spots uh, for this one. I think he's got a great starting position as far as having a little bit of a tow rope uh, through some of the dunes, get him warmed up. And then, uh, and yeah, Hey, if he makes it to the front, I stand by what he say, what I said, you know, he can, he can navigate from the front. He knows how to open a stage. He's confident with it. He's confident with his abilities. He's got a lot of great riders around him. So I'm sure he'll be able to use that to his advantage as well. So we're looking forward to that one. Uh, if not, you know, I think it's going to be one of the sand guys. It's going to be one of the sand specialists. And well, as far as I know, they also happen to all be riding Hondas. So we'll find out a little bit more as this progresses. So 
stay tuned. We've got some stuff coming up. We've got more NAR files coming up as well. Uh, we've got another check-in with Jacob Argybright that is going to be dropping here in the next day. And then we've got another one, too, coming up for the rest day. Very, very awesome. You guys will find out more about it tomorrow, though. All right. That is a wrap. Remember, guys, it'll make sense when you get there. Enjoy the ride. All right, that is a wrap for the Chasing Waypoints podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Looking forward to our next one coming up. Remember, if you are out riding, do not forget to tag us at Chasing Waypoints. Hashtag Chasing Waypoints. And if you haven't already, get on over to the website. Get signed up for the newsletter, The Bivouac. North America's Rally Raid and Adventure Riding newsletter hey let's have some fun let's find out what are you guys up to let's get you featured if you're a brand and looking to get supported get some eyeballs get some ears on your business absolutely hit us up send us a message at podcast at chasing waypoints but anyway that is a wrap remember shiny side up see you guys